Um, hello, hello everybody. How's everybody doing? Um, I think I will start to talk now. So uh, my name is Trin Yi and that's George over here. And uh, we're from the platform recovery team in Pivotal. And today let's talk about how to design a disaster recovery plan for your CI foundation. Um, before we move into the talk, let's talk about today's agenda. Uh, we will first talk about why do we need to have a disaster recovery plan. And then we will talk about disaster recovery as part of business continuity. Then we will move on to cover the topic on um, high availability. And then lastly, we will talk about uh, common approaches for designing a disaster recovery um, plan. And as part of that, we will talk about Bosch Back and Restore, the BBR, um, like the CLI that the platform recovery team is maintaining. Well, first you may ask, why do I have to think about disaster recovery? Is this something that I really have to think about? Is it going to benefit me? And answer to all of that question is yes, you should always have a plan because everything can fail. And when they do fail, they will fail in unexpected and mis misleadious way. So yes, we should always have a plan. And because when things does goes to the failure mode, you don't have the luxury of running away. You have to go there and actually fix your platform. Okay, so let's talk about what kind of uh, failures that we're dealing with here. So first set of issue can be software related. We all know that upgrade is hard and if you're upgrading your CF deployment, that upgrade can fail and that can occur platform downtimes. And it, or unfortunately your platform is under some kind of security attack um, and that has polluted your data stores and now you need to roll back. Second set of issue can be hardware related. Um, it is very uncommon for a data center failure, but like we should still acknowledge that and this is a possibility. And uh, or it, it can even be a planned hardware upgrade. Like you're switching for faster machines, better machines and CPUs and actions like that can generally occur down times and all kinds of risks as well. And let's not forget about user errors. There are loads of things that operators and application developers can just accidentally delete. Um, operators can accidentally delete availability zones. That's really scary. And or deleting some kind of disk as VMs that they shouldn't have. Or given the right privilege, application developers can accidentally delete mission critical apps or CF orgs and spaces as well. And of course, all of the failure modes that we were just talking about in those previous slides will have a negative impact on the availability of your platform and services that are running on the platform. Failures may impact the availability to push applications. So that means that you cannot do CF push and you cannot roll out any updates for your applications. And maybe that's the time you need to do a security updates. And that's, that's just really bad. Um, it can also, well, if the failure mode means that your application is not rollable anymore, that means you're having downtime for the applications, and that's really bad, and we want to we wanna avoid that too. And as the platform operator, you may have service level objective agreements with the users and consumers of your platform. So really, having those downtime may mean that you cannot meet your service level agreement. Um, that you agreed upon before. And that's really what we are talking about here today and we're tr trying to um, give you some approaches and ideas that we can do to mitigate that. Cool. Um, so before we go into uh, figuring out how to plan about disaster recovery, let's talk a little bit about disaster recovery and business continuity. Um, so I'm gonna start with definitions. Um, and I'm going to try and kind of differentiate into these two terms. So disaster recovery is about the tools and the procedures to uh, be able to uh, recover your vital technology infrastructure after a disaster, after an incident. Uh, business continuity, on the other hand, is the ability to minimize the business impact during as well as after a disaster. And I'm going to try and explain this in a bit more detail. Uh, but first, let's talk about business impact. What is business impact and how do we measure it? Um, one of the frameworks I like the most is coming from Enterprise IT and it's called uh, Business Impact Analysis or BIA. And the idea of business impact analysis is that you can measure business impact. Uh, the main takeaway though is that uh, it kind of um, categorizes it into a few different areas. So business impact could be financial. Your workloads are down, so you're losing money. Uh, it could be uh, reputational. Um, the reputation is sometimes something you can't recover from, losing your company's reputation. 
Uh, it could be regulatory, uh, if we're talking especially about the financial uh, industry. Uh, it could be life or safety, talking about healthcare industry, uh, or it could be legal. So these are just the areas that uh, we can measure business impact in. Um, so we mentioned about uh, business continuity being uh, kind of aiming to minimize business impact. I'm going to give you one more example uh, to sort of differentiate between disaster recovery and business continuity. And in this example, I'm going to use tracks. So um, imagine you have a track which is carrying a very uh, time sensitive payload, and uh, that track needs to deliver that payload from origin to a destination. Now, the incident is that this track gets a flat tire. And your disaster recovery plan is to carry around a spare tire. So when you get a flat tire, you replace um, with a spare tire, and then your truck can uh, continue its journey to deliver the time-sensitive payload to the destination. So this is recovering from a disaster. We lose a tire, we replace it, uh, we finish the job. How about surviving a disaster? This is about business continuity now. Now in this case, we have two trucks. Right, because it's so time sensitive, this payload, that we can't afford to wait for the tire to be replaced. So when the incident happens, when we lose the tire from uh, track A, all we have to do is move the payload to track B. So track B is going to deliver uh, the payload to the destination. So this is minimizing the business impact. In this case, business impact is possibly financial. So if I don't deliver the time sensitive payload on time, I'm going to get fined. Combining both is actually a full, a full plan, a full business continuity plan. So not only you need to minimize your business impact, deliver the payload on time, but you also need to recover your previously broken down track. So combining the two is actually how to deal with disaster. So I hope this kind of makes the differentiation between business continuity and disaster recovery a little bit more clear. Um, another way to approach this is to think of them about time. So uh, when there is an incident, our first kind of um, priority is to minimize business impact and then to return to a previous good state. And today we're going to talk about minimizing business impact using high availability terms. So designing a platform for high availability and therefore making sure that in the face of a disaster we're going to minimize downtime and recovering to a previous good state is going to be the second part of the talk which is going to be on disaster recovery. So let's start with high availability. Um, first things first, uh, we need to measure, we need to identify our availability needs. And um, we're going to use uh, service level objectives, availability service level objectives to measure our needs, measure our requirements. Um, and availability SLOs are basically the agreements between the consumer and the provider of a platform about the minimum uh, set of availability for that platform or workload. So if we talk about SLOs for workloads, so the applications that are running on your platform, uh, we need to identify the business impact uh, of a particular workload being down. And again, remember the business impact analysis framework I mentioned before, five types of uh, impact that you can measure. And we also need to keep in mind that not every application, not every workload may have the same uh, SLO. So in some cases, you might have some workloads that are more sensitive, uh, and therefore need a higher SLO. Um, five or six nines, as people um, like to, to kind of uh, use the terminology. And you may have some uh, other workloads that are less sensitive. Now let's talk about the platform. And it's very important to differentiate uh, availability requirements for the platform and the workloads. Now for the platform, again, we're measuring business impact. But what is the business impact of the platform being down? Not the workloads, just the platform, just the control plane. Now, examples here could be uh, loss of productivity, right? My platform is down, I cannot CF push. So I have 100 developers just sitting around doing nothing. Not great. Um, auditing observability. My workloads are running, but I really don't know what's going on. I've, I've lost my platform control plane, and I have no metrics. Security patching. That's another big one. So again, measuring uh, that impact of the platform being down and kind of coming up with an SLO is really important. And once we have these SLOs, then we can start thinking about how do we implement these SLOs. And there are obvious things like, hey, don't run 
uh, both jobs with one instance. Um, always use multiple VMs or always use multiple availability zones. But the one I want to emphasize on is the idea of using multiple independent foundations, possibly geographically distribu distributed. So different deployments, basically. And there are some challenges in that. It's the most expensive way of achieving HA because obviously you have to duplicate and also keep uh, foundations in sync. And there are multiple patterns there. Uh, active Active, for instance, is an example as a pattern where uh, both foundations are serving traffic, or active passive is an example where you have two foundations, one serving traffic and the other one just waiting there for a failover. Uh, there are challenges, as I mentioned, keeping them in sync and generally maintaining them and managing them. There are challenges around data services. How do you have two different foundations accessing the same data services? Um, there are challenges outside the platform, such as traffic. How do we uh, properly route traffic or failover traffic in the case of a, a disaster? Um, but this is an interesting area to look into for high availability. Now, let's talk about disaster recovery uh, as a second part. Um, and again, we need to start with uh, measuring our needs and measuring our disaster recovery uh, requirements. And in this case, I'm going to introduce two uh, metrics. There are RPO, or recovery point objective, which basically is deciding how far back we want to be able to recover. Um, and that has to do with um, how granular you want to recover it to be. Are you, can you afford to recover to the uh, last week's state? Can you afford to recover to yesterday's state? How frequently is your platform changing? And then there is also RTO, uh, recovery time objective, which basically is how long does it take for recovery to happen. Um, so what does recovering workloads mean? What, what do we need to recover when we talk about recovering workloads? There's, of course, application code, uh, which you may or may not be able to repush it. There's application configuration and environment variables and its service bindings. And there is the application data. And when we talk about recovering the platform, uh, things we need to consider is the infrastructure itself, so any VMs, any networks, any storage devices, uh, the configuration of the platform, uh, things like orgs and spaces, uh, things like uh, security groups and any, any installed build packs, custom build packs, anything you have on the platform. So how do we define RTO and RPO? Um, I don't have great answers for RPO, but for RTO, uh, one uh, thought I can give you is um, think about what you've done for your availability solution. The, how is your topology? Do you have one foundation? Do you have multiple foundations? How are these foundations if you have multiple working together? Uh, and then base it based on that. So if you have a single foundation, obviously you're going to have a very low RTO. You need to recover really fast because if you lose a foundation uh, and or workloads on that foundation, you need to recover really fast. Um, but if you have multiple foundations, if you have invested in uh, having multiple foundations serving traffic, then you can afford to have a higher RTO. Maybe it can take you like eight hours or a day to recover, and maybe that's fine. So once you have thought about um, the recovery objectives, and we can talk about solutions. Uh, and in this case, there are two main schools of thought. There is a backup and restore uh, approach, for, which we're going to talk uh, mostly about. Uh, and then there is the automate and recreate approach. And these are not exclusive, they can be used together. Um, but one thought I want to leave you with is uh, think of both of them as a tax. Because any investment and any cost that you're paying towards these approaches, either taking backups or automating, doesn't necessarily have an immediate return. Uh, it's a tax that you pay that you may or may not uh, get value from in the future. So when we talk about automate and recreate, what tools are there? Um, there's obviously Boss Bootloader, a very good tool to kind of bootstrap your infrastructure, uh, recreate your Boss Director. Um, Concourse CI to maybe re-push and re-deploy, actually, redeploy your foundation. Uh, any CI CD tools to re-push applications. And there is a tool called CF Management um, without any vowels, um, which uh, you can use to declaratively define and push configuration to your foundation, orgs and spaces, and any other sort of configuration. Um, the idea there is that if you can find a repeatable way to recreate your foundation, then you can then ask your developers to repost their workloads. And that's a bit challenging because that means that developers have to agree on a CI CD solution so they can all repost their workloads in a seamless and kind of consistent way. 
Um, but that would be the uh, theoretical approach. The other approach is backup and restore, and Jun is going to talk to us about BBR. Yes, so let's talk about Bosch Back and Restore. Um, the Bosch Back and Restore, what we call BBR in short, is a CLI tool for backing up and restoring Bosch deployments and Bosch directors. The BBR CLI is responsible for orchestrating the backup and restore workflow. And at the same time, it provides all kinds of hooks so that stateful individual Bosch releases can implement their own backup and restore scripts. So uh, the important bit here is that BBR as the backup restore tool actually does not have the full knowledge about how to backing up how to back up a Bosch deployment or the Bosch director. It only provides those hooks, again, like it orchestrates a workflow. It relies on the um, release authors themselves to write, um, to write backup and restore script. So the reason behind that being, uh, we think release authors are the expert of their own releases. They know how to back up and restore their own releases. And uh, as the platform recovery team, we do not want to dictate that. Yes. Um, let's talk about like briefly talk about what's the data in Cloud Foundry and what's the data in Bosch Director so we know, we know what we're trying to back up here. So in CF, we have individual components that are like, well, clock controller, UAAs, the router, and they all have states and they store states in the, um, in the database. It can be an internal MySQL that's de deployed alongside as your CF. It can also be an external database that you're using, uh, like RDS or Google, Google Cloud SQL. Um, on the other hand, we also have staged applications like uh, what we call droplets, and those are stored in the blob stores of CF. Similarly, in Bosch, the director stores its data in a database and also compiled releases and packages in its blob stores. So in short, when, we, when you're using BBR to back up a Bosch deployment or a Bosch director, you are backing up some sort of um, SQL database and, a, um, and the blob store. Okay, so let's dive a little bit deep here. Imagine that you're a CF operator and um, you're tr you want to try out BBR and you just type BBR backup CF in your command line. What that's going to do is BBR would then find all of the VM that's associated with this deployment called CF. Then it will SSH onto all of those VMs and try to find and execute all of the backup related scripts here. So because those are backup scripts, uh, there will be backup artifacts created in those remote VMs. And BBR would then be responsible for transferring all of those um, remote artifacts back to wherever you're running your BBR command from. And of course, if, we're, if the goal is to be able to restore your entire platform, backing up, only backing up your CUF deployment is not the end of story here. So you also need to back up your Bosch director, which is covered by BBR. You also use BBR, again, to back up your CF and any kind of data services that your application may be relying on. So um, if the data services are also deployed as a Bosch deployment and they also have BBR script in, um, implemented, you can, you can use BBR to back those up. If not, then you have to seek um, alternative solutions to back those up uh, yourself. Okay, so all of those are just basics and you're like, okay, I, s I already started using BBR to back up my foundation, what else? So uh, let's talk about some, um, some, r some good practices that you can keep in mind when you're trying to back up your foundation. First is the frequency of the backup. You should always, always align the frequency of your backup to the desired uh, recovery point objective for the platform. So as George uh, talked about before, recovery point objective is the time that you're, you're going back at that given restore. So for example, if you're restoring from a backup that you have taken three days ago, then the recovery point objective here is three days. And if your desired recovery point objective is three days or four days, then you're good here. However, if your desired recovery point objective is two days, then it's not the ideal case, right? So you have to align the frequency of, of the backup to what you want here. Second, um, maybe consider using an external blob source or a database. Um, that, that way you're diversifying where you're putting your state and hopefully that can mitigate the risks when things does go wrong. And always try to put the job that's going to take your backup in a pipeline. Um, I think it's pretty basic knowledge here that you can't rely on one single person to take your backup every three days. That's not going to work. The person's going to be sick or not remember it. And so always try to put that in some kind of CI CD solution. 
And the good news is, if you're already on concourse, there is a set of tasks that can take a backup of your foundation, and it's maintained by the platform recovery team. You can go check it out in that link. And lastly, um, we'll definitely try out restoring process once, at least once, before you have to do it in real time. Um, because the restore process can differ based on how your deployment, how your platform, your deployments are deployed, and it can also differ based on what is feeling exactly. So getting yourself familiar in the game is definitely gonna help at that once in a lifetime restore time. Cool, um, so just to close, uh, backups are attacks, automation is attacks. Uh, backups can be large, they can be slow, they can uh, take lots of uh, storage to save them. Um, automation is also attacks. Uh, agreeing on a common CICD with your developers may not be a very easy thing to do. Um, maintaining your own automation for your platform uh, may also be expensive. These are, con and this is also continuous investment. Um, these are taxes worth paying for, though, and uh, it's up to you to choose which tax you pay and how much of its tax you pay. I mentioned before that uh, automation and recreate versus backup and restore are not mutually exclusive. You can choose to kind of have a hybrid approach uh, where you uh, do some of um, automation and recreation versus backup and restore. Um, that's all from us. Uh, we are at uh, the BBR Slack channel in the open source Slack. Um, you can find BBR uh, on GitHub. And are there any questions? All right, let's call it. Wait, wait, wait. So if there are no questions, I got to ask one. I'm sorry. All right. Um, no, you have to suffer from this. So I like the, um, the talk about recovery point object objectives. Um, so, in your experience, what is the, like, let's say, the minimal RPO I can get to for a reasonably sized Cloud Foundry installation or foundation? Is it in the order of days, hours, minutes? Like, where can I get to? Uh, the minimum. So, um, we've seen people taking daily backups, so that means an RPO of up to a day. We've seen others uh, try and take hourly backups. Um, I don't think, I think the minimum it really depends on uh, how much you can spend on backups. It's a trade-off, right? Uh, if you can afford to take hourly backups, yeah, then yes. Um, uh, if, if you have like external blob stores, so taking a backup of the blob stores is very cheap, um, and you can, in a relatively small foundation, you can take hourly backups, and that would be great. Um, it also depends on, on how frequently the foundation is changing. Uh, we've seen some foundations with very specific set of workloads, uh, that are not being updated on a, on a daily basis necessarily. Um, so a daily backup may make sense. Um, I think most common uh, frequency is, is daily. Uh, so an RPO of a day, if that answers your question. For sure, thanks. Yeah, so the question is uh, to do with uh, Active Active Foundation. I'm sorry, I'm repeating it for the recording. Uh, active Active Foundations and um, how do we, well, how we seen in terms of data and data replication um, for Active Active Foundations. Um, unfortunately, I'm not the best person to answer that question. Um, we've seen uh, uh, deployments of uh, MySQL, for instance, or uh, variations of MySQL uh, with the ability to be multi-site. Um, Synchronization is a very expensive thing to do. So I don't have any very specific uh, kind of answers to that, but I can definitely connect you with some people who might help. Cool. So you call it, Marco? Awesome, thank you.